So we'll go ahead and start. So I was asked to talk about the sequencing uh, of the new agent and uh, how to manage uh, their toxicity. Uh, so this is my uh, uh, outline. We'll go over an introduction, go over the approved targeted therapy, uh, and then how to sequence them and the toxicities with the clinical scenarios. So this slide summarizes all the CLL medications. In red are drugs approved for CLL, and in blue are drugs approved for other B-cell malignancies. So as you see, uh, 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 these are the classic DNA damaging drugs that we had in the early 2000s, and they were the only drugs available. Then the anti-CD20 antibodies became available Later on, the B cell receptor inhibitors, which work on different steps of the B cell receptor activation, SIC, BTK, PI3 kinase, whatever. And then uh, recently we had the cell-based therapies like CAR T cell therapies. These are not approved for CLL yet, but they're approved in other B cell malignancies. And then we have the anti-apoptotic BCL2 inhibitors and the MCL1 inhibitors. This is not approved in any indication, but BCL2 venetoclax is indicated for uh, CLL. So this is a very nice graph that shows the improvement in outcome in different age group and different patient population, like green is females, uh, blue is males, okay, and uh, dotted is different age group. So it, this is the drugs. As you see, the, as new drugs are being uh, available on the market, the five years overall survival is jumping with any new introduction of a new drug. So definitely these drugs are helping the patients in different groups and different age. And this slide is a very busy slide. Uh, Dr. Firas and Dr. Chowdhury already went over the important studies. Uh, so on the top you see the important study that led to, it, to the approval of different chemoimmunotherapy combinations like uh, FC versus FCR, this is the CLL8 trial, which showed that FCR is better. And then you have CLL10BR versus FCR, FCR is better, except in the subgroup above the age of 65, where they were pretty much close to each other. And then you have here the ofitumumab with FC better than FC. Uh, and then in the treatment naive and fit, uh, obinutuzumab with chlorambucil versus chlorambucil. This is CLL11 trial. And then the, uh, 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 this is ofetumumab, uh, chlorambucil. And then the CLL11, this is in frontline treatment naive and fit, uh, gaziva or obinutuzumab, chlorambucil versus chlorambucil. And then on the uh, lower part, you see all the trials that led to the approval of different targeted therapies in the treatment of CLL. Uh, as you see, the Resonate trial, the ECOG Alliance, Illuminate, and Murano trial. And these are new trials coming along uh, using combination chemo uh, therapy and combination targeted therapy. Uh, and this is uh, more to come, other targeted therapy being tested in different B-cell malignancies, including CLL, Zen Abrutinib, and Acal Abrutinib. Uh, actually, Acal Abrutinib was approved a few days ago uh, for relapse refractory CLL, uh, plus many others, like Duvelisib is approved in the relapse refractory, but now it's being tested in the treatment naive. So we have a lot of agents, and all of them uh, have activity. So as of now, the only approved medication are four targeted therapies, okay? Uh, the abrutinib, idilalacib, venetoclax, and duvelacib. So we'll go over the data for each one, and then we'll talk about uh, how can we sequence them. Abrutinib was tested in different uh, trials. The first trial, first uh, big size trial, phase three, was the resonate, okay? And as any drug, these drugs get tested in the relapse refractory, okay? And when they show good efficacy, they move to the front line. So resonate was phase three relapsed refractory ibrutinib versus ofetumumab. Ofetumumab was one of the standard at that time, okay? It's anti-CD20. And ibrutinib wins, okay? And then they moved to the resonate two, okay? So it is phase three, but the treatment naive, okay? And the unfit for chemoimmunotherapy patient. So treatment naive, unfit, 
ibrutinib versus chlorambucil, which is a standard, okay, chlorambucil for unfit patient, and ibrutinib wins. Then you have the Resonate 17. This is restricted for 17P deleted patient, and it's phase two single arm showed very good efficacy of ibrutinib and 17P deleted. So, and then they tested ibrutinib against the standard of care FCR, frontline, treatment naive, chemoimmunotherapy eligible. Okay, this is the ECOG trial. Okay, here the resonate was frontline, uh, the resonate two, but treatment naive, unfit for chemoimmunotherapy. So this one was fit, so FCR fit patient. And in this trial, ibrutinib rituximab was tested against FCR, and ibrutinib rituximab won, except in subgroup analysis, okay, the uh, mutated group of patient got almost the same benefit with FCR and AR. There was a trend toward AR, but it was not statistically significant. Otherwise, in all subgroups, uh, IR was better. Then the Alliance trial, which was a phase three, treatment naive, IR versus BR. So as you see, they're mimicking the trials that were done to test different chemoimmunotherapy protocols. Like this one is like the FC versus FCR. This one is like the FCR versus BR, okay, the CLL trial. But, see, but here it's testing IR versus BR, okay? And in this trial, treatment naive patient uh, and uh, aged above the age of 65. Okay, so not fit for fludarabine-based therapy. We're treated with this combination, and IR was better than BR. The Helios trial was a phase three relapse refractory, a brutinib bendarituximab versus bendarituximab, uh, and uh, the arm containing a brutinib was better. Illuminate is a phase three trial, treatment naive, elderly, and this tr trial is like the CLL11, uh, the one that tested Gaziva chlorambucil versus chlorambucil versus chlorambucil rituximab, but here they did uh, ibrutinib Gaziva versus Gaziva chlorambucil, and the ibrutinib containing arm was better. So based on these trials, ibrutinib is indicated anywhere you want to use it, okay, in the treatment of CLL. However, my only exception is a frontline patient, no 17P, okay, especially if he's immunoglobulin mutated. So these patients will get a good PFS with FCR, okay, and this is a limited therapy. So why to subject them for a continuous therapy for years, okay? So this is my only exception, especially if they are mutated. And as we spoke, the FCR 300 trial showed that 65%, six, above 60% actually of these patients, the mutated immunoglobulin, will have 10-year progression-free survival, okay? So you might not need any therapy for 10 years. Next agent is idelalacib. Idelalacib was also tested in the relapsed refractory uh, uh, in combination with rituximab versus rituximab placebo and the idelalacib arm one. And then there is another trial, also relapsed refractory. Idelalacib was ofetumumab versus ofetumumab placebo and idelalacib was better. There was a phase two frontline trial Okay, in patient above this, at the age of 65, not eligible for chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, so in this, in, in this phase two, there was impressive uh, response rate of the high risk sub, subgroups, uh, like the unmutated and the deletion 17P, where almost 100% of these patients responded to this agent. So it seems to have good efficacy against uh, this high risk population. However, it's a pretty toxic drug, as we'll see later on. It has a black box warning, and this is why it was only approved for relapsed, unfit for chemo patient. Okay, so relapsed and unfit for patient. It's not approved in the front line, and actually it's not available on the market. The, the company apparently is not uh, investing uh, in this drug. Uh, the f uh, thir third agent is venetoclax. Venetoclax was first tested in the Murano trial in the relapsed refractory, like any agent, so which is a phase three VR versus BR and VR arm win, okay? And then there is a trial of uh, venetoclax and deletion 17P relapsed refractory that showed very good efficacy of venetoclax in this population. Uh, the M14032 trial was a phase two uh, of venetoclax and relapsed refractory CLL, 
failing ibrutinib and idilalacid. Okay, so in this uh, trial, they studied patients who failed on ibrutinib and were treated with venetoclax or failed on idilalacid and were treated with venetoclax. It's phase two, it's not randomized, but venetoclax showed very good response rate and very good PFS as compared to uh, uh, standard of care. The CLL14 is uh, a phase three trial of venetoclax, gaziva versus gaziva chloramidocil in a frontline CLL. So this is like the CLL11 trial, okay? Gaziva chloramidocil versus chloramidocil versus rituximab. So this is unfit patient frontline therapy, and it's a limited duration therapy. Treatment uh, goes for one year only, okay? And uh, the venetoclax uh, containing arm uh, was better. So based on these trials, venetoclax is approved in the relapsed refractory and frontline, but restricted to unfit patient here, okay? Not fit patient. And then the fourth agent is duvelisib. Duvelisib is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, gamma and delta inhibitor, as compared to idelalisib, which is uh, only uh, uh, gamma. So the phase three trial, do your trial, was duvelisib versus ofetumumab in the relapsed refractory CLL and the duvelisib containing arm uh, was better. So this is a relapsed refractory. Now this trial, the key exclusion criteria were uh, prior treatment with BTK or PI3 kinase inhibitors, okay? So we don't know if duvelisib will work on patients previously treated on these, okay? Because these were excluded from the trial. So based on this trial, duvelisib was FDA approved for relapsed refractory CLL after at least two prior therapies. Also, why two prior therapies? Because it has some toxicity, pretty much like idelalacib. It's a little bit easier on the liver, but it has, it shares all the other toxicities with idelalacib. So it has a black box warning, pretty much like idelalacib. So based on this, here's what the scenarios we get in clinical practice. You either has a frontline fit patient, frontline unfit patient, or relapsed refractory patient. And you have here the targeted therapies uh, that work in this patient population. So for frontline fit, whether 17P or non-17P, ibrutinib is the only targeted therapy uh, that can be used for frontline fit, okay? Frontline unfit, 17P, non-17P, okay? Ibrutinib and venetoclax are both approved, and this is based on the CLL11 trial, uh, CLL14 trial, venetoclax gaziva, okay? And the relapsed refractory, all four agents are approved. So in the fit frontline scenario, you don't have a problem with sequencing what to use, okay? Because the only available drug for you is ibrutinib. And the frontline unfit, you have to choose in between these. And in the relapsed refractory, all four are approved, and then you have a problem on how to sequence these. So how to sequence these in clinical practice, okay? We know from the trials that were run that ibrutinib works after idelalacid failure because the ibrutinib trial had some patient treated with ibrutinib and failed and were randomized. Venetoclax trials, as you saw the phase two trial, the one that tested venetoclax after failing ibrutinib or failing idelalacid, showed that venetoclax offers good PFS on these patients, so it does work. Duvelisib trial excluded the prior treatment with PTK and PI3 kinase, and there was no patient treated with venetoclax on this trial. So we don't know duvelisib, whether it will work after these or no. We don't have any data, actually. We have limited data of ibrutinib use after venetoclax use. So venetoclax used before ibrutinib, and then ibrutinib used later. We will we'll show this data. However, Having different mechanism of action tells me that there is no reason that these drugs will not work if you sequence them uh, the way you want. They have different mechanism of action. So this trial here shows uh, the venetoclax use. This is the trial I spoke about after ibrutinib and idelalacid failure, okay? So patients who failed uh, Idelalacib or ibrutinib treated with venetoclax, okay, they have same PFS, okay, and they have a good duration of response. So basically, if you use venetoclax after ibrutinib or idelalacib failure, you expect that it will work just good, okay, 
regardless of what they fail. So it does work after failing these drugs. Now, novel agents post ibrutinib. This trial, 391 patients treated with ibrutinib, okay? And the patient who failed ibrutinib were treated with different second line options, okay? As you see, the options here were another antibody, okay? Uh, uh, venetoclax, chemoimmunotherapy, or kinase inhibitors, okay? And you see the overall response rate is the best after using venetoclax. So venetoclax after ibrutinib uh, showed the best overall response rate and the best CR rate, okay? So this also tells you that venetoclax works after ibrutinib failure. So ibrutinib before venetoclax here, okay? Again, another trial. Okay, relapsed refractory CLL patient, 600 patient, okay, treated with uh, ibrutinib. Uh, the other trial is in the front line. This is in the relapsed refractory. And as you see, these patients who failed ibrutinib were treated with venetoclax or idelalacep, and you see the best response is with venetoclax here as compared to idelalacep. So again, venetoclax works well after ibrutinib failure. And this is in terms of overall response rate, CR rate, and uh, so on. So how about if I use venetoclax first, and then the patient fails, and I treat them with ibrutinib? Does it work? Yes, it does work. And this is, but the, the data is limited, OK? So this is a, a paper by Jennifer Brown in blood uh, last year that showed patients who were uh, uh, treated uh, uh, with ibrutinib after failing uh, venetoclax in the uh, outpatient setting, uh, it's not a trial, okay? So you see 11 patients here were treated with venetoclax, okay? And this is the median duration. Some of them were treated for years, actually. And most of them got PR on venetoclax, except this patient got stable disease, okay? And then this is the ibrutinib treatment after venetoclax. All of them got PR, actually, uh, except the same patient who got stable disease on venetoclax. So basically, they all responded, and some of them have good PFS, like three years, uh, 26 months. Okay, so ibrutinib uh, after venetoclax, it seems that it works, okay? We just need more data. Here we have 11 patients. Here we have the patient treated on Murano. Remember, Murano trial was venetoclax rituximab. Okay, uh, so patients who failed uh, venetoclax on that trial were treated or, uh, with ibrutinib, and we have data from eight patients, and pretty much the same data as here, okay? So they all responded to ibrutinib. So it seems like ibrutinib works after venetoclax. We just need more data. Now, what else can you use uh, to help you what to choose of these agents, okay? So you can use some biomarkers. As you see here, P53 and immunoglobulin mutation, as I told you, they had no effect on PFS by using uh, idelalacep, okay? It was a phase two trial, so it seems that idelalacep is not affected by these, okay? So this might be a good option for a patient. A number of prior therapies, okay? Uh, you get inferior PFS uh, with more prior therapies with ibrutinib as compared to venetoclax. And the bulky lymph node setting, okay, ibrutinib works very well, venetoclax not as much, okay. Uh, uh, if you have high beta-2 microglobulin, you get inferior PFS with ibrutinib, no data on the other agent. Complex karyotype has no effect on both, and we don't have uh, any idea here. Notch 1 mutation has no effect on ibrutinib. However, you get inferior PFS with venetoclax, CD49D status has inferior PFS with ibrutinib and unknown on the others, okay? And of course, if you have resistant mutation, these drugs will not work, okay? This mutation is resistant to ibrutinib. Upregulation of MCL1 pathway is resistant to venetoclax, and the GLI-101 val mutation is resistant to venetoclax. However, these mutations and upregulation does not happen unless the patient is on the drug, okay? So there is no scenario where you get this mutation before the patient is exposed to ibrutinib or this mutation before the patient is exposed to venetoclax. So the other thing that can help you is the toxicity. 
As you know, these new agents come with different types of toxicity, and these are the major toxicities, okay, with each of them. So bleeding, AFib are common with ibrutinib, as we'll see later on. And if you have a patient who is already bleeding or who, is, uh, who has uncontrolled AFib, so this is not a good idea to try ibrutinib on them. Transaminitis, pneumonitis, and colitis, autoimmune phenomenon with idelalacib and duvelacib. So these are not a good option in patients who have already autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, whatever, pneumonitis, interstitial lung disease. And venetoclax, the major problem is tumor lysis syndrome. And this might be not a good option in a patient with borderline kidney function and, and a good burden of disease. Metabolism of this drug can help you sometimes to choose. They're all safe in renal failure, okay? So this doesn't help to prioritize one over the others. However, the liver dysfunction does, okay? So as you see here, ibrutinib needs adjustment starting from class A child liver cirrhosis, okay? Uh, as compared to child class C for venetoclax. So venetoclax is more tolerable in patient with uh, liver dysfunction. And what's surprising is the PI3 kinase inhibitors are also safe in patient with uh, some liver dysfunction, despite the fact that one of their major side effect is uh, transaminitis, okay? But it seems like in liver failure, you can use them even with class uh, child C. So other factors you use to sequence these drugs, access to new therapies. Do you have access or you don't have access? Like a few days ago, I was in Bahrain, and a patient was presented to me. Uh, he's on ibrutinib, and he's having side effect with ibrutinib. He's old, uh, so he cannot be treated with chemoimmunotherapy. And they were asking, should we stop ibrutinib on this patient? So the first question was, is he responding to ibrutinib? They said, yeah, very nicely. Second question was, what do you have alternative if you stop ibrutinib? They said, nothing. They don't have access to venetoclax. Okay. So access to new therapies is very important. Uh, bulk of disease uh, and the risk of tumor lysis and kidney status. Steroids and BTK inhibitors lead to a lot of fungal infection. So if you have a patient on long-term steroids for a rheumatoid arthritis or whatever, it's better not to use BTK inhibitors. And we spoke about the comorbidities, toxicities. Continuous versus fixed duration. The only targeted agent that offer limited duration therapy now is venetoclax. All the others are continuous until progression. Whether you are planning to use transplant in the future, we saw a lot of patients from today's presentation, young patients, that you might think about transplant, okay? And in these patients, usually it is better to uh, reserve venetoclax to the last line before transplant. Why is that? Because venetoclax leads to a lot of MRD negativity in the bone marrow, okay? So you would use venetoclax just before transplant, clean the MRD, and then transplant them, rather than using ibrutinib before transplant, because ibrutinib, as you saw, rarely leads to CR, actually, and much rarely leads to MRD negativity. So uh, this is a very important uh, issue here. So in summary, ibrutinib works after idelalacib failure. Limited data suggests that ibrutinib works after venetoclax failure, okay? Venetoclax works after both failure, okay? And on duvelacib, we don't have any data whether uh, these agents work after it. Uh, and again, this issue might be irrelevant in the future because these targeted therapy are being targeted together and uh, uh, short-term therapy is being studied, but this is to keep in mind. So toxicities of the new agents. These new agents come with new toxicities, as we spoke. So we'll go over each one. Ibrutinib, as you see here, uh, so common toxicities are bleeding, diarrhea, fatigue, rash, arthralgia, hypertension, AFib. And you see the grades here, like the bleeding, most of the grades are grade one. Rarely it's advanced grades, same for diarrhea, fatigue. But for AFib, you have, and for hypertension, you have some uh, advanced grade toxicity, okay? Uh, now, most of these side effects resolve with time, okay? And most of them does not happen after six months. Uh, however, hypertension is the only one that keep increasing with time, okay? 
Now, why this happens? Because of target inv uh, uh, inhibition of ibrutinib. So ibrutinib targets CXCR4, and this is how it causes lymphocytosis. It targets EGFR. This is how it causes rash and diarrhea. PI3, AKT, this is how it causes atrial fibrillation, and the other BTK enzymes, and this is how it causes bleeding. So as a general rule, when you get toxicity with ibrutinib, any of these toxicities, if you have a non-hematological toxicity, so non-hematological, pneumonitis, diarrhea, skin rash, above grade 3, so grade 3 and above, okay, you have to hold your, uh, uh, your treatment. Wait until the uh, toxicity goes back to grade 1 or baseline, then you restart. Okay, the first restart, when you do it first time, you restart at 420, the same dose, okay? Then if the same toxicity recurs on the maximum dose, okay, you do the same. You hold once you're back in level one toxicity, okay? Then you restart with one pill less, okay? So the dose for CLL is 420, right? So you, you are treating with 420, toxicity happens, you stop, you restart for 20. Second time it happens, you restart 280. Third time it happens, 140. Fourth time, you stop, okay? So if on the lowest dose you have toxicity, you have to stop. Now keep in mind that treatment breaks are associated with reduced survival. Dose reduction is not, okay? So when you stop treatment, you might be risking your patient. However, if you have to do it, you have to do it. Now. For hematologic toxicity, okay, grade three or greater neutropenia with fever or infection or grade four, then you have to do the same, okay? So this is the dose de-escalation, okay? With the first toxicity, you restart the same. Second, two tablets. Third, one tablet. Fourth, you discontinue. You cannot use it, okay? So this is the AFib. Uh, incidence from uh, ibrutinib trials. And as you say, uh, as time goes, the incidence goes down. And most of the uh, grades are grade two. However, you can see some grade three toxicity. So here, let me talk to you about this case. This is a 75 years old CLL stage one in 2009. And, and in 2019, July of this year, we had to start therapy for steroid-resistant ITP. So he had ITP, we treated him with steroid, came back, treated him with steroid again, actually. We were trying to avoid treatment. The uh, ITP came back. So we had to start therapy. Uh, his prior history is cabbage in 2006. He also has hypertension. So we started him on uh, ibrutinib, and in mid-October 2019, he developed AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular rate, okay? So this is symptomatic AFib, and here, if you want to scale it on the CT-ACE side effect uh, scale, it's grade three, actually, because it's symptomatic, urgent intervention indicated, okay? So here you have to stop, as we said, any non-hematologic toxicity, grade three and above, you have to hold your medication until the toxicity resolves, and then you restart with the full dose. So ibrutinib was held, and he was started on beta blocker, and then ibrutinib was restarted after controlling his rate. Okay, so beta blockers are the agents recommended to slow down uh, the AFib in patient on ibrutinib. And then how do you manage this patient? How do you decide whether they need something else besides uh, uh, rate control? So you have to decide about anticoagulation, okay? So if you have a low child sco uh, two score of, uh, uh, by definition of zero, you don't need any antiplatelet or anticoagulation, okay? Chats score of one, then optional to include aspirin in the treatment of these patients. And chats above two, anticoagulation is recommended. And DOAX are safer than any other anticoagulation with ibrutinib, okay? We'll speak about that later on. If you have a patient using aspirin, okay, for cardioprotection and develops AFib, okay? So you have a patient on aspirin, ibrutinib, develops AFib, and his chest score is high, then you treat with anticoagulation and stop uh, antiplatelet if possible, okay? 
If you have a patient requiring dual antiplatelet therapy, you have a patient stented recently on dual antiplatelet, you cannot use ibrutinib, okay? You have to discontinue it. Now, if you have a patient who needs antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet for a short period, like a month, this patient will get uh, the bare metal uh, stent, okay, and you just need to treat for a month. You have the option of interrupting therapy for one month and restarting later on once they are on single agent. But dual agents, it's, uh, it's a contraindication. Uh, warfarin, it's a black box. You cannot use it with ibrutinib. So our patient, back to our patient, we did CHADS2 score. So he's more than 75. He gets two points. He's male, zero point. CH has uh, congestive heart failure, no. Hypertension, yes. And no strokes. He has vascular disease. He's had cabbage, okay. And he's not diabetic. So he gets four points. He's high CHADS2 score. So you have a patient, he's on ibrutinib, developed AFib, you did rate control, now you have to anticoagulate. So we started him on apixaban, and this is the most agreed on agent to start with ibrutinib, okay, apixaban, uh, one of the du uh, duacs. You can use the others, but this is the preferred agent, okay. So here comes the other problem of ibrutinib. What if he bleeds, okay, because bleeding is a common problem with uh, ibrutinib, as you see, one to seven percent, okay, had major bleeding in clinical trials, okay. Most of the other bleedings were grade one and two, and there was no need to modify treatment, like subcutaneous bleed is very frequent, ecchymosis, okay, on ibrutinib, but that doesn't need adjustment, okay. So for minor bleeds, what do you do? Uh, you do not interrupt, and there is no evidence that if you get minor bleed, you're at higher risk of major bleed, like if you get Echemosis doesn't mean you'll get CNS bleed, okay? And for major bleeds, if it is outside the CNS, of course you have to hold ibrutinib and hold anticoagulation. If it's outside the CNS, platelet transfusion is recommended even if the patient's platelets are normal. If it is in the CNS, platelets are not advised, okay? Now, another question comes along is what do we do with ibrutinib if a patient is going for a, an operation? Usually you have to stop three to seven days before and after surgery, depends on how risky the procedure is, okay? If you have a small procedure in the skin, probably you don't need to interrupt it because it's a skin procedure. You see if he's bleeding, you can apply compression. But if you have an intra-abdominal or intracerebral, then probably you'll go for seven days interruption. Now, so again, antiplatelets can be continued with ibrutinib, okay, but not double antiplatelet. Again, if you have short-term double antiplatelet uh, treatment, you can hold ibrutinib and restart, but if it's for long-term, you cannot use ibrutinib. This is very high risk, okay? Anticoagulant against Dowax or Nowax are the preferred, and Apixaban is the preferred from these drugs. This is just to tell you how many patients were treated with either antiplatelet, anticoagulant, or combination on the ibrutinib trials. And you see a lot of these patients were treated with uh, any of these uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant. So recommendation for the use of anticoagulant. What if you need a patient who had VTE? What do you do? And they're on ibrutinib, okay? So if you, have ex if you need extended anticoagulation, okay, in a patient who's on ibrutinib, DOAX are the preferred. And after six months of therapy, it is preferred to cut down the dose to half, okay, of these DOAX. So this is a patient who needs long-term unprovoked VTE, okay, you treat six months full dose with DOAX, and after six months you have the dose, okay? Now, if you have a patient who is in a short course for VTE, so if your patient has not already started on ibrutinib, you can consider waiting, you know, CLL is not an emergency, and then after you finish your restart, this is safer, if you have to start, okay, ibrutinib, or if the patient is already on ibrutinib and he had a provoked VTE, then DOACs are safer, and you cannot use anti-vitamin K, and avoid additional antiplatelet, okay, when you, uh, when you use uh, DOACs. Of course, you have to instruct your patient to avoid all other antiplatelets like NSAIDs, fish oil, vitamin E, or aspirin-containing products. And warfarin and other anti-vitamin K are not, uh, are absolutely contraindicated with ibrutinib. So this is another case, 80 years old from al-Baha, 
okay, came in with symptomatic uh, CLL, actually. So basically, nothing surprising here, leukocytosis and uh, having fatigue. Uh, so workup was done. The leukocytosis was monoclonal uh, B cell consistent with uh, CLL. Uh, CD38 overexpression, beta-2 microglobulin elevated. So we did bone marrow, diffuse involvement of the marrow, uh, diffuse lymphadenopathy, but no bulkiness on CT. Fish showed trisomy 12. Uh, and he was started on ibrutinib in September 2016 due to progressive cytopenia. So this is the case, as you see here, the count, and here the drop in hemoglobin. So we had to start him somewhere here, September. And as you see, initially the count goes up and then goes down as expected. So in early May 2017, he develops maculopapular rash, bilateral upper extremity and upper back, okay? Uh, we gave him uh, hydrating creams and topical steroid. It went away, it recurred in November 2017, same therapy, and then recurred in October 2017, and same therapy was given and resolved. Since then, he didn't have any recurrence. So back to the indication for uh, toxicity and the recommendation for, for toxicity. Again, this patient had grade two, so which is rash less than 30% of the body surface area. So no need to interrupt your therapy. Again, non-hematologic toxicity, more than a grade three, three or more, you have to interrupt and restart when the toxicity resolves. So this patient did not have it. We did not interrupt. Okay, we kept him going on ibrutinib. And from the literature about the uh, skin toxicity, you know, because it's an EGFR uh, inhibitor, this is how it causes uh, the uh, uh, rash. The incidence is uh, 13 to 27 percent, and there are two, two uh, clinical pictures of the rash. The non-palpable late onset, okay, uh, one is the recurrent one that needs skin-directed therapy, and there is a palpable pruritic rash that happens early after starting ibrutinib, uh, and usually this one does not recur. Hypertension is another side effect of ibrutinib, and as you see, as we all said, as you go on the treatment, your risk of uh, ibrutinib-induced hypertension goes up, okay? So this is the only risk factor or only toxicity that doesn't ease up with, uh, with the time. And uh, patients, usually these are all patients and they have already hypertension. However, uh, more than grade three hypertension, okay, with ibrutinib happened in 26% of patient treatment naive and 22% in relapsed refractory, okay? So it is frequent to have in both setting when you use ibrutinib in both uh, setting frontline or uh, relapsed refractory. And again, the incidence remained constant and increased over time, okay? Of course, how do, uh, do, you, uh, uh, do you deal with it? Uh, uh, if it is more than uh, grade three or above, then you have to intervene, you have to hold your ibrutinib because it's a non-hematologic toxicity. If it's less, you adjust your uh, medications, you add medications to help controlling uh, uh, the blood pressure. A very important note here to uh, uh, avoid uh, CYP3A inhibitors because these increase the level of ibrutinib and increase the toxicity when you choose your antihypertensive. Now, idelalacib, duvelacib, again, these are the PI3 kinase, PI3 kinase gamma delta inhibitors. So as you see, they cause a lot of uh, autoimmune toxicity, pyrexia, diarrhea, fatigue, nausea, cough, pneumonia, they both have a uh, black box warning about these uh, uh, toxicities. Additionally, they cause a lot of uh, immune suppression, okay? So you get a lot of infection with these agents. And as you see here, this is for diarrhea. So it plateaus the incidence of diarrhea around the 28 month, and probably this is not a plateau, this is where the patients uh, stop their therapy, okay? So the diarrhea plateaued but you see the incidence keep rising with the use of these agents. So what do you do for diarrhea in these patients? Basic workup, so you do your physical exam, you make sure they don't have infections, a travel history, and
and rule out C diff, check electrolytes and all this stuff. And then if you have grade one to two uncomplicated diarrhea, you can uh, manage conservatively by doing a non-diarrheal uh, diet, which we'll uh, see later on, and starting loperamide, this is the dose, and then reassess in 24 to 48 hours. If the diarrhea resolved with this intervention, okay, you continue the diet and you gradually uh, discontinue uh, loperamide, okay? If it doesn't resolve, then you go to this diagram, which is unresolved uh, diarrhea or higher grade diarrhea management. Of course, you have to do your work of uh, ruling out infections and all this stuff. You have to discontinue the drug here, okay? And if with the discontinuation of drug and the IV fluid, the patient is not, uh, the diarrhea is not easing up, you have to use steroid. You can use budesonide or orals or IV if the patient cannot tolerate. Uh, and then once it resolves to grade one, less than one, you continue the diary instructions and uh, you taper off your steroids. Now, you can reinstitute idelalacep at a lower dose, okay, but this goes into a clinical judgment. Case by case depends on how severe the diarrhea and how bad was it and how long you had to treat with steroids. So this is the diet modification. As you see, it's not an easy task to follow. Uh, basically very strict diet to avoid uh, any uh, bowel stimulants and uh, uh, any uh, uh, fiber diet. Now, uh, also as, you say, uh, as we said, it can cause transaminitis. So you have, when you start therapy, you have to check every two weeks for the first three months, every four weeks for the next three months, and thereafter depends on each patient. And then if you get toxicity, depends on the level of the ALT, AST, you have to check more frequently. Now, if you have a toxicity where the ALT, AST elevation are more than 20 times upper limit of normal, permanent discontinuation is recommended, okay? If you have five to 20, okay, then you have to stop and then restart at a lower dose. Pneumonitis can happen, uh, and the incidence is around 3%, okay? Uh, management, uh, again, uh, depends on the toxicity level. If your patient is uh, already on, st uh, on uh, uh, oxygen, because of that, you might need to, uh, uh, to hold uh, idelalacib and uh, treat with uh, uh, steroids. Of course, you have to rule out infections specifically pneumocystis carini, okay? And it is recommended to have your patient on PCP prophylaxis, prophylaxis when you treat with idelalacin. Neutropenia is not infrequent. As you see, grade three and four is 31%, okay? And drug interruption happened in 3.6% uh, of these patients. And usually it happens early on after starting the treatment. Management is GCSF support and you monitor the blood counts frequently for the first three months of treatment. Uh, again, pneumocystis and CMV uh, prophylaxis are recommended with idelalacin. Last one is venetoclax. Uh, so here is just to show you the cases of tumor lysis that happened uh, with the venetoclax and the treatment of CLL. And uh, this is a very important uh, syndrome to uh, uh, watch for on venetoclax. Uh, you can get what we call laboratory TLS or clinical TLS. The laboratory is when you get disturbance in two of the electrolytes, okay, Hypo hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia. So just laboratory signs of tumor lysis. Clinical is laboratory signs plus clinical implication like nausea, vomiting, lethargy, edema, edema renal failure, and so on, okay? And... Uh, uh, so again, it can cause rapid reduction and uh, predispose to TLS, specifically during the ramp up period when you start your dose escalation. And you can get tumor lysis as soon as six to eight hours after the first dose. Uh, and the highest risk uh, period is when you increase your dose in the ramp up. So each time you increase, you have to make sure they did not go to, to uh, tumor lysis. And you can categorize your patients according to their risk of tumor lysis, and this depends on the bulk of disease by count, okay, and lymph node size. 
So if you have count less than 25, lymph node size less than 5, this is low risk. Okay. If you have 5 to 10 centimeter or count more than 25, this is medium risk. And all the others are uh, high risk. Okay. If you have bulky more than 10 centimeter and high count with intermediate size lymph nodes, this is high risk category for tumor lysis syndrome. And you have to watch very carefully. And this is what's recommended, how to monitor when you start your treatment. So you classify your patient, low burden, high burden, or low risk, intermediate risk, high risk for tumor lysis. And this is the frequency of checks that are recommended when you start therapy or you re-escalate your dose during the ramp up, okay? If tumor lysis syndrome happens, you have to hold your venetoclax, okay? And if it resolves within 48 hours, then it can be reduced, uh, resumed at the same dose. If it took more than 48 hours, then you have to reduce your, uh, your dose. When you resume your dose, of course, you have to uh, apply all the prophylactic measures and uh, count check. And the prophylactic measures here are hydration. Usually it's started two days before venetoclax, okay? So you tell your patient to drink plenty of fluid, and then you use antihyperuricemic to start two to three days before starting venetoclax. Neutropenia is not infrequent with venetoclax. As you see here, 45% of the patient got uh, a neutropenia, and 41% of these neutropenia were grade three and four, so this is something to watch for as well. And how do we deal with it? Pretty much like any neutropenia. If it causes fever or uh, uh, infections, then it's considered grade three and above, you have to interrupt your therapy. Otherwise, you can keep your patient on the drug and use GCSF. Also, venetoclax has some uh, gastrointestinal side effect like nausea and uh, diarrhea, but these usually happen early and resolve very quickly. Uh, serious infections are not frequent uh, and most commonly occur in the first three months, and this is uh, usually related to the uh, neutropenia incidence. And thank you all, and happy to take questions.